but the logic they're using, which is that in care homes, people are vulnerable. Well, yes, but they're all double vaccinated, probably anyway. Mm. And in hospitals where we know a lot of people die from COVID because that's where you get it. Mm. What's the difference really between all those places and other places where people work? Well, the key thing is that the vaccine doesn't stop transmission of right. the virus. Well, so that's, that's the main that's, thing, really, isn't that's, it? That's, that's the main thing to hone in on. Um, and of course, things like this can be pushed through because they cherry pick yeah. data. So you, you just mentioned in your intro um, the misuse of statistics yes. by the NHS chief exec. So she said there were 14 times more patients, um, COVID patients in hospital in November than this time last year. Right. That was not true. It was true in August, right. but it wasn't true in November. Actually, on the 5th of November, there were 7,072 patients in hospital and falling. And on the 5th of November 2020, it was 10,994 right. patients and rising. Yes. Now, people are wising up to this. They're wising up to this plucking out of the air of the big numbers mm. and using them to support narratives. And they're really objecting strenuously, which I thought was great. You know, yes. the NHS isn't getting away with it anymore. But it's not the first time. It's not the first time, is it? What they do is, you know, there's um, a narrative they want support, which mm. this time was get your COVID booster. And then they look around for supporting evidence. And they did a really bad job this time. But just over a year ago, um, in December, Simon Stevens, former chief exec of the NHS, said on the 29th of December that there were 20,426 patients in hospital with COVID. Yeah. Now, that number was true, but it was a misuse because I had some privileged access to insider NHS info at the time. And actually, only 20% of those people had gone to hospital because they were ill with COVID and been admitted right. for it. A further 25% caught it after they were in hospital right. for something else. Because it is the one place you know for sure you're going to catch it. Well, it's it's one of the big problems of the epidemic, hospital-acquired mm. infections. And then the remaining 55% had tested positive after being in for something else but didn't really have COVID symptoms. So they took this big number and used that to drum up fear in order to support that January mm. lockdown. So this kind this kind of happens over oh, and does. over again. Well, I had a doctor on last week, an NHS osteopath, who told me uh, when I pressed him on it that there were two thousand, effectively two thousand pregnant women in uh, ICU units in hospital, right? Yeah. And it turned out that was exaggerated by a factor of ten. Mm. And he told me that there were nine thousand or thereabouts people in ICU units around the country. When in fact it's nine thousand of the total number of COVID patients, not in ICUs, but just in hospital. So, mm. and then he later uh, sort of said on Twitter, oh, I didn't manage to get the numbers right. And you go, well, you got them wrong by quite a substantial amount. So either you didn't know what they were after you told me that there was a lot of pregnant women who were unvaccinated who were having, um, you know, ICU treatment. It turned out to just to be complete rubbish. There are some, but there's not 2,000. You know, we can all make mistakes and get numbers wrong. There's also a thing of confirmation bias. People are looking for what they want to see. Mm. But if you go on radio, you have responsibility to try and get the numbers right. I do my reams of homework for yes. you, Mike, every week. You have to try and get it right. Um, and it's really irresponsible to drum up fear like that. Mm. But this is, I think this is just really damaging trust in um, the the mainstream media. Somebody called it the misleadia, I uh -huh. noticed on Twitter yesterday. Right. But also now the NHS, because NHS bosses should not be doing this. Mm. And that's that's just not good for because, us long yeah, term, well, is it? Yeah, because it's not good for them. It's not good for the credibility of the NHS for a start, because the person we're talking about is Amanda Pritchard, isn't it, who is the, the head of NHS mm -hmm. England, now, she should surely know better than to give out wrong information. And if she had said, for example, in August it was higher, but now it's lower, presumably that was not the message she wanted to, 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 to sort of pass on. She wanted people to think that the numbers were going up, not down. Mm. So I'm, I'm reluctant to say she made a mistake, and I'm more, more likely to believe that she did it deliberately. Well, if she didn't, somebody did. Mm. Somebody in her team did. This, this can't possibly be an accident. It's too, it would be too stupid. Yeah. I'm and sure then we're now told stupid. there's something like 100,000 people in, in the NHS who are not double vaccinated, right? Which is about 10% of the population, apparently. Uh, sorry, not the population, of the, of the number of work, workers in the NHS. Now, some of them may not be on the front line. Some of them may be in back rooms. Some of them may mm. be in offices. You know, but they're now going to be told, maybe, that they're going to lose their jobs in April. Yeah, so we've got two crunch points coming up. On the 11th, that's the day when care workers mm. are going to lose their job for not right. being vaccinated. You've already covered that this morning with that, that video. 
and um, yeah, NHS staff are next. So I've just published a story from an, NH, uh, an NHS nurse. They're anonymous in the story because they don't want to lose their job. Right. Um, this is somebody who has been a nurse their whole working life. And this article is so moving. I've, I've already had a, a vicar email me this morning offering to counsel them and a doctor on the phone in tears and other NHS staff contacting me. It's so moving because this nurse is searingly intelligent and insightful about the whole epidemic mm. and really, really cares. This is someone who's born to be a nurse. Now, they have reservations about having the vaccine for their own personal reasons, right. but one of which is they've had COVID and they have antibodies. Right. And they understand that the vaccination doesn't provide them with sterilising immunity, which they don't need because they've had COVID, but mitigates symptoms. And they don't want to have the vaccine. And they've got reasons for that, which shouldn't be anybody else's business, in my view. Even if your no. employer says you should tell us about this, in most cases, you don't have to. You know, if you're suffering from something um, which is your own private affair mm. and your boss comes to you and says, what's wrong with you? Are you on some kind of medication? You are under no obligation to tell them that, to give them your private medical information at all. Well, you shouldn't be. And this nurse shouldn't even have to say so in, in this article, except they want to you know, convey their whole perspective on it. Mm. So because of that, this is a nurse who will end up leaving the NHS. And this is exactly the kind of nurse you do not want. You do not want this nurse to leave the NHS. No. They should be there. But that's not the whole reason. Also, they're, they're appalled. They're in knots about the idea of a two-tier society. And part of the reason is they have practical experience of working with COVID patients. So they do something that's called um, COVID patient remote monitoring. It's effectively a virtual COVID ward. Right. So they look after people before they're in enough to be in hospital, okay. provide symptom support, reassurance, monitoring, and transfer them to hospital if they need to. And every single one of their patients right now is double and triple vaccinated. Mm. So it doesn't stop you getting COVID. No. And that's given them this additional perspective. And I mean, honestly, befuddled wouldn't, they're befuddled, in pain, confused, and angry about the fact that vaccines would be mandated for anybody. Right. And they can't be part of it. So when this happens in the NHS, not just because they don't want the vaccine, but because they don't think this should happen to anyone, mm. they'll leave. Yeah. How, how and we're we, already how told we here well and if say for example um 50 of those 100,000 people decide to get vaccinated you still lose 50,000 and apparently we're already in a short shortage of, uh, of of supply for nurses for doctors for all sorts of people right yeah but what, are you, what about people that say but surely if you're in the nhs you would want to uh be vaccinated because there is that belief abroad where there are some people and i've heard them say it well, surely if you work in the medical business, you would be vaccinated because either you believe in it or you don't. OK. And that's a kind of a strange thing to say, I think. I think it's strange. I mean, this nurse in, you know, in their own experience, they've had every vaccination booster they've ever been asked to have. They don't want this one for all the good reasons right. I've just explained. And that's completely understandable. But you could have any sort of reason for an exemption. It's, it doesn't mean it doesn't negate you wanting to be in the NHS or to care right. for people. Yeah, it doesn't mean that you don't believe in the NHS or that you don't believe in medical, um, you know, cures for things, does it? No, I think that's a really simplistic argument that's being used to, to turn around on people and attack them yeah. for completely reasonable and personal objections. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just fed up with it. It's facile and it's mean, actually. It's yes. an oversimplification. But then there was a report in The Telegraph yesterday. Now, this is, re this is a really important statistic, but it's being misused, that 11,600 people have died after catching COVID in hospital. Right. This is something I've been trying to alert people to since last summer. I wrote my first article about um, hospital-acquired infections last year. It's really important we know this number, but this number is being used to prop up the idea that NHS staff should be vaccinated mm. as a justification for mandating vaccinations. But what else could we use that number for? We could say, well, look, hospitals are built like mini cities and it's useful in lots of ways to have lots of health care under the same roof. But for an infectious disease, it's a nightmare. Mm. We could use this figure to talk about the fact that um, NHS staff haven't had adequate PPE, especially at the beginning. Right. You know, you had ITU staff that were fully goggled up, but everyone else in a pinny and a surgical right. mask, and also a lot which doesn't what, do anything. And an awful lot of what they were doing and what they thought they were doing for good, like cleaning surfaces and all of that, they then later said it didn't matter. Yeah, right? sure. A emphasis on fomite transmission yeah. rather than the fact that it's an, an airborne yeah, aerosol virus. Exactly. 
Totally. Um, or we could talk about the fact, well, this figure shows that one of the biggest problems we've had in the epidemic is hospital acquired infections and lockdowns were never going to touch that, no. apart from reducing overall traffic in hospitals. But no, what this figure is being used to do is justify the fact that NHS staff must suck up their mandatory mm. vaccination. It's another example of a big number being cherry picked to support a story. Right. And what they don't give you, and I had this with the conversation with that doctor who gave me the wrong figures, I said, what we don't see or are never told is the numbers of people who are dying who are still over the age of 80. You know, if there is a rise, for example, in the number of people going into hospital, which they say was in August, mm -hmm. who are those people? You know, what are they suffering from? Do they have comorbidities? Are they vulnerable? Because there's an awful lot of people that have not been affected by this disease. Loads, in fact. Mm -hmm. But the majority of the population have not been in contact with COVID or haven't had it. Those who have had it mostly have been fine. Mm -hmm. But we don't, all we hear is that it's a very dangerous disease and lots of people are dying and, you know, we must be able to prevent these deaths. Well, not necessarily. Yeah, well, it's interesting when you see people um, in broadcast coverage and in the papers who are suffering in hospital and often they're the um, unvaccinated but regretful infected yeah. COVID patients. They, they look young, you know, they're, they're really looking hard to find these young people yeah. because this is this is data we have. Of course, most people are, are elderly or they have comorbidities mm. or they're immunocompromised. That's yes, that that's would clear. seem to be the majority of people who are injured. I remember watching mm. a Channel 4 news report um, back in the summer of last year where they went inside an ICU unit where, surprise, surprise, they found some people who weren't very well. And I'm going, well, it's an intensive care unit. Of course, they're not very well. But they were well enough to be interviewed, so they weren't actually, you know, on death's door. But they were three. Pa there were three patients in this COVID ward, uh, which was an ICU ward, mm. and all three of them were, were, able, were well enough to talk and be interviewed by the by the woman with the camera and the big microphone. And it was just this kind of absolute horror story that they were mm. trying to create. And it was simply, well, this is what happens in an ICU ward. People yeah. are lying there in a bed. They don't look great. That they're not dying. They're fine. Mm. Well, you know, there's, a bit, there's been this kind of uh, three-pronged uh, approach to making people do what they're supposed to do. There's the cherry-picking of the big numbers and the misuse of statistics to frighten right. people. Then there's the, the patient. There's the, there's the heart-rending story of the suffering patient, you know, the victim of COVID. And then there's the anxious pleas from overworked hospital staff. Mm. But I think it's wearing really thin. It is. I mean, personally, I find it depressing to see the same old lines being trotted out over and over again. But like I said to you before, people are wising up and they are beginning to object quite strenuously. And it's looking, it's looking poor, isn't it? Well, an awful lot of the reports I get from people just visiting hospitals is that, by and large, they're quite empty. There's not a lot of people in them. If you go to an A&E ward, there's not a lot of people there. I got a report from somebody down in Cornwall the other day who said that if you're rushed to an A&E uh, down here, you're taken in triaged and sent back out to an ambulance to wait indefinitely to be admitted to hospital or to the A&E department as long as you provide a negative PCR test. So if you're being rushed to hospital, they're not actually treating you and allowing you to be admitted to that hospital unless you test negative for COVID. But more than likely, you'll test positive once you've been there for a couple of days. Oh, I mean, you know, it's oh, mad, it's, isn't it? That is bonkers. Did I tell you about um, going to A&E with my son, though? Did, did we talk about I don't think that? so. Okay, so I had to take my son to A&E because he broke his hand. Oh, dear. And, um, what, recently? Uh, it was quite recent, yeah. It was a couple of months ago. We had to give up waiting because it was actually too crowded. Mm. It wasn't empty. Right. It was it was really busy. And what they said to me in A&E, and I don't want to come across as GP bashing, but they said GPs aren't seeing people as That's much. True. So they're really overwhelmed in A&E. We had to leave. We mm. had to leave with an untreated broken hand and go back the next day because we were going to be there all night. Right. And as we arrived, somebody else was leaving with a broken foot. They hadn't been seen, hadn't been triaged. It was not good. No. It felt like we are in some kind of medieval sixth circle of hell, actually. Yes, and that is the problem, because the knock-on effect of all of these things, not working properly, like the GPs not mm. seeing people properly, not diagnosing things properly, means people are getting sicker and having to go to A&E or having to be admitted for, for something that if they'd been seen earlier, mm. they wouldn't have had to be. Yeah, and actually the nurse in my story brings this up as well. So, yeah, if people want to read that, it's I think it's really important. They need to understand this first person account of what it's like to be a nurse facing losing your job. Mm. So go to my Twitter feed or yours because I, I saw you shared it this morning. Yeah. And, and people should people should read that. It's very poignant. It's very moving. This is a, a deeply intelligent nurse. And what does she think NHS she's going to do? Leave. But can she get another job somewhere? 
cross that bridge when mm. they come to it. Yeah. I'm not saying she. I'm very careful with anonymity. Oh, okay. They. Right. They is not they. non-binary. They is anonymous. They. Yeah. <laughs> I never I thought I'd hear myself say it. I know. I just try I try to be really careful because they, you know, they're hoping that this won't happen yeah. and they don't lose their job. And it could be that that's what the government's doing because there's a large percentage of people who are vaccinated. I'm looking at some numbers here, right? Number of first doses administered to NHS Trust healthcare workers uh, in the records is 1,350,384. Number of second doses, 1,307,832. So 93% have had a first dose, 90% have had a second dose. Well, for me, there's no good scenario here. They're either going to do it, mm. which is a, a hideous encroachment on people's bodily sovereignty, but also it makes no sense scientifically, or they're bullying people. Yeah. And I, I don't, that we're caught between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. And I, I can't believe those are the two options mm. from our government. But also, is it not odd? I, mean, I think it's very odd that these places of medicine, places where sick people go, they're trying to make it so that you can't be sick if you're there. And it's kind of, it's like doctors that are saying, don't come into the surgery if you're, if you're ill, which is what they're saying, believe it or I not. Know, know. Don't come into the surgery unless you've had a COVID test. If you're ill, don't come in. I mean, these people have signed up to a life of care, you know, which of course has risks. I'm sure that people have caught all sorts of infectious diseases when they've been nurses and doctors over the years. But you, you know that that's part of the risk of the job. It's like if you become a police officer, you know that there might be a chance you get into some kind of punch up. Somebody might try and stab you. You know, it goes with the territory, doesn't it? You'd think so. Right. Can I just talk about something else that our horrible yes. government are doing? And another reason why I'm on eight out of ten on the Angerometer. Okay. okay. Christmas. Christmas. Yeah. So our government of Grinches mm -hmm. are dangling this threat about cancelling Christmas oh, yeah. over us again. But Can why? Well, so um, Sajid Javid said that... Um, if we all come together and play our part and get our boosters, we can save Christmas. Um, and I didn't know it was in jeopardy. <laughs> well, oh, well, if you didn't, you, you <laughs> should, because there have been threats to Christmas since mid-September. Mm. Um, you know, ostensibly about supply chain. You know, everything from turkeys to trees is under threat. Oh, yes. Well, I do shortage of the day now because it's so ridiculous that all the things that we're told we're going to run out of, some things we are slightly short of, but not really. Apparently mm. there's a shortage of walkers crisp at the moment, believe it or not. Our government um, has told us this to such an extent that people are actually buying and selling them on eBay for eight quid a packet. I mean, that's the society we now live in. That's a bit tragic. I don't, mind, I don't mind who run out of Brussels sprouts, but That'd everything else I want in plentiful supply, including seeing my family. So Sajid Javid said that young people should urge their older family to get vaccinated. Really? And I'm like, I'm not going to tell my mum what to do. No. This is outrageous. Does he boss his parents right. around like that? But it, what a weird thing. What a weird, First of all, if you're not good boys and girls, we might cancel Christmas. Mm. And by the way, boys and girls, go and tell your naughty, your naughty parents yeah. to go and get vaccinated. This is not how it should work no. in a family. It's not our place to boss around. No. Our elder relatives but are told what to why, do. It's, it's the, up to them. They're grown adults. See, talking going, going back to climate change on Friday when it was Youth Day up in uh, Glasgow and the BBC and Sky were interviewing all these kids, right? who was saying, oh, we must do this, we must do that, you've got to, you know, give up eating meat, we've got to save the planet. It's like, shut up. <laughs> Just shut up. Mm. I'll ask you for your advice when you're a bit older, thanks. I'm not taking the advice of an eight-year-old. Yeah. The as to what car I should be driving. Thanks. Uh, yeah, don't turn us all into younger armies to, to bully no. older generations in what no. to do. I mean, that's not cool. I mean, and I don't think my mum would appreciate me telling her what to do. No. She can decide which medical intervention she chooses to have. But I'm really fed up with this idea that Christmas needs yes, saving. I know. And is this really what this government wants to be remembered for? You know, Cromwell is still remembered for cancelling oh, Christmas. Yeah. Does Boris Johnson want that to be I his legacy? I don't think he does. But I think Sajid Javid is a bit of a character on this front because he's the one that made them all start wearing masks again inside the Houses of Parliament because he said or somebody said to him don't you think it's a really bad example that the Tory party don't wear masks mm. so guess what next time we saw them at PMQs most of them were wearing masks and he seemed so promising when he started he did. it didn't take long to go native no, did it no so I don't want to be defeatist or gloomy but it this has actually it's actually hit me a little bit mm. it's not like me to talk about my feelings Mike I know in public well I'm glad that I've been able to bring that out but I'm you, you were coaxing it out of me. The thing is, I actually feel like I can't make plans for Christmas. I was thinking, should I? My kids are a bit old for it, but should we book a panto? Should I take them to the theatre? And I thought, well, what's the point? It might be cancelled. No, you should. No, you should definitely do that. 
should I? Yeah. Well, I know the one thing that won't be cancelled, and that's that's going to go and see my mum. Yeah. I, I don't really care what rules are brought mm. in. I'm not going no. to cancel a family Christmas. But I do feel slightly defeated about the idea of, of planning something in the real world that could be snatched away Taken at the last away. minute. Because no, when no. it was snatched away last year, it was the 20th of December. I remember. We were told to be good boys mm. and girls and save Christmas. And on the 20th of December, they snatched it away. I remember. And I don't want to go through that again. No. So I don't want to feel myself being uh, sucked into this sort of defeatist, gloomy thinking because mm. Christmas should be a bright, bedecked, tinselly bauble of joy right. to look forward well, to. Well, I'm going to America. So um, unless they stop me doing that, I don't care what they do. Well, what about travel restrictions? Well, you might exactly. end up they might, they rowing might go, your way there, well, like might, Greta yeah. Thunberg style. Yeah, exactly right. They might end up going, oh, so the Americans might go, oh, look, the English have got so many uh, problems now, we're going to ban them again. Because that's the mm. other thing that happens. But hopefully it won't happen. Yeah. We shall see. Long live Christmas. Yeah, long live Christmas indeed.